Writers and pop culture have painted this picture about Anne that she had come to English court a s l u t. I can think of more ways than one on how even if Anne wanted to be an s l u t, how that would have been extremely unlikely. Thanks to historian Haley Nolan and her many reliable primary and secondary sources, I can help to articulate for you. How Anne, in fact, did not come to Henry VIII's court, a s l u t. Follow along with me on pages 17 through 19 of Haley Nolan's book, 500 Years of Lies. Some historians have tried to argue that when Anne moved on to serve the wife of the notorious womanizer, King Francis I. She most definitely must have been corrupted. That, as French historian Breton once said, no one leaves the infamous French court chaste, and that this is how Anne became the sultry seductress the world has come to know. However, if we look closely into the time Anne spent in France, we discover that she lived an extremely sheltered existence. And was never exposed to the legendary shenanigans for which the court was well known. In fact, far from joining a court of debauchery, when Anne entered the service of the French royal family in the early months of 1515, it was a sad and subdued time. When Claude's father, King Louis, married Mary Tudor. It had been a mere nine months since Claude's mother had passed away. Fifteen-year-old Claude was so distraught that she cried throughout her own wedding ceremony to her twenty-one-year-old husband Francis on the eighteenth of May, fifteen fourteen. The court at Chateau Royal de Blois was still in mourning when Francis's sister Marguerite de Angoulême joined them. Taking on the role of big sister to Claude and her younger sister Renee, to add to Claude's misery, several days after her wedding, her new husband left for Paris to be with his mistress for two months. As Queen Claude began her spate of obligatory pregnancies, she spent more and more time retired within the castle at Blois, accompanied. By Anne Boleyn and her other ladies in waiting, living what sounds to have been a pretty dull life of seclusion. Tudor historian Elizabeth Norton confirms that Queen Claude was renowned for her piety and keeping her household apart from that of her scandalous husband. It's well known among Anne's more serious biographers that in this household. She was educated in a strict code of conduct and the highest moral standards. Claude was known for being reserved and retiring. She rarely made public appearances, which was why it was said her husband's sister, Marguerite de Angoulême, was queen in all but name, performing most of the duties usually required of Claude. Even when attending the legendary Field of the Cloth of Gold, it was Claude's mother-in-law, Louis of Savoy, and sister-in-law Marguerite, along with her husband's official mistress, who stepped in to perform Claude's duties in the event. Vitally, what this demonstrates is that as lady in waiting, Anne was given rare opportunity for the life of smut and corruption. She was meant to have led in her early years in France. Now, the reason for Claude's isolation was less to do with social anxiety and more to do with illness. She was never a healthy girl to begin with, walking with a limb from a young age, and she soon found herself crippled with continual pregnancies, giving birth to seven children in eight years. That's a lot of time to be pregnant and confined to bed rest. So, what did Anne Boleyn and her fellow ladies do during those months Claude was being churched alone? After careful discussion with the Chateau Royal de Blois, where Anne and Claude spent the majority of their time, 
it's thought likely that Anne would have been put to work in the retinue of other members of the royal household. But who? Well, let us consider the evidence. Two decades later, in 1535, Anne would write to Marguerite de Angoulême, saying that her greatest wish, next to having a son, was to see you again. Quite the statement for someone who she had known for at only a distance. Similarly, in 1534, when Henry VIII wanted to get out of a meeting with Francis I, Anne was the one who sent a message to Marguerite via her brother George Boleyn that she was in fact pregnant and needed Henry by her side, so could they possibly postpone? Pretty intimate information to be sharing with someone she barely knew. It's certainly not the kind of excuse you would give another politician, which the royals of Europe essentially were in the 16th century, if schedules had to be changed. It is these glimpses into the obvious intimacy of the two women's friendship that indicates it was most likely that during Claude's bouts of sickness and pregnancy, Anne and the other ladies-in-waiting were placed in the unofficial service of Marguerite. This explains why Francis I referred to Anne Boleyn as Claude's lady, lady rather than his sister's, because officially that was the role she was contracted to do. Yet if you are an avid reader of Tudor biographies, you will be aware that this friendship is something that many have set out to discredit. But why do historians feel it necessary to prove, or more to the point, disprove, that Anne was close to Marguerite during her time in France? Because Marguerite was a renowned reformist and a huge supporter of Francis's leader of religious reform, Jacques Louvre de Tap. So, of course, such a strong religious upbringing for the young Anne Boleyn does not, I repeat, not fit in with the slutty, scheming, seductress image we have of her. It works much better for historical writers on hashtag Team Aragon if Anne was involved in the immoral depravity that we are repeatedly told was rife at the French court. End quote. Nolan sources are quite fun to research, and I'll list them down in the description area below for you. But as a researcher or historian, checking out the sources of sources, for example, as I'm reading Nolan's book, I'm also looking at the sources, if I can, that she's used to support her evidence of Anne. If there are secondary sources, you want to check those out as well in order to see their sources. Your goal is to narrow it down to a primary source, like investigating a case, if you can. Sometimes the only way a primary source can be looked at is by going in person and getting special access to it. For example, if I wanted to take a personal look at Anne's Book of Hours that she personally owned. Nolan's primary and secondary sources are fascinating in themselves because they provide accounts, letters, and papers about or from Anne. I do recommend, if you have free time, working on tracking these sources down and coming to your own conclusion about who Anne was. Well, listeners, I hope that you enjoyed this episode of the Anne Boleyn case. Don't forget to royally hit that subscribe button. And until next time, as always, keep loving history and stay curious. Bye.